So welcome again to our channel and we are live from Genesis DevCon in uh, Bangalore and the event which is being held, organized by IBC Media and uh, once again we are uh, in, in another interview and with me right now is Yanislav Mahalov. Uh, his nickname is Yanni in, in, in industry when you'll speak you'll talk to him so people recall him as Yanni and he is uh, the founder of Eternity Blockchain but he is also known as the godfather of Ethereum. So I welcome him on the show and we'll love to uh, ask him my first question that why people uh, call him as uh, godfather of Ethereum. So welcome Yanni. Thank you. Thank you for welcoming me here today. So my first question to you is that many people uh, in industry you are known as godfather of Ethereum. So, mm -hmm. so can you just tell us something uh, mm -hmm. more about that? Why? Uh, you are known as the godfather of Ethereum. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in short, I had hired Vitalik before there was Ethereum, before he started writing the Ethereum white paper. We were working on a project to mm -hmm. uh, create a custom colored coin protocol mm -hmm. for Bitcoin back then. Um, and we were chatting, um, I published this chat log. If you Google for Godfather of Ethereum, you'll find the blog post with this chat log. We're chatting about what to improve or what can we improve with such, let's say, new token protocols. And I suggested to have updatable algorithms mm. on uh, blockchains. Uh, so not to essentially hard code the protocol by the core developers from the beginning, but to be more dynamic. And uh, Vitalik started one or two days later, he started writing the Ethereum white paper. And uh, I guess uh, the rest is history now. Yeah. So uh, my next question to you is that uh, now you are the founder of Eternity Blockchain. So what Eternity, so if a, for a non-techie -tech guy, because there are a lot of people who are, you know, exactly non-technical. Non, non so for them, if you have to explain Eternity, in mm. a simplest of uh, manner. Mm. So what will be that? What, what, what Eternity is solving what other blockchains are not mm. solving? Uh, so um, Eternity is a decentralized blockchain. For us, decentralization is very important. Scalability is also maybe the main mm. thing what we worked on to essentially be able to have a decentralized but still scalable system as well as a very useful or usable system. So the scalability we improve through state channels, um, so that smart contracts can stay private by default okay. uh, and only get exchanged among the counterparties who are active uh, in this contract. So it's very similar how when you write a paper contract, you also would share it only with the counterparties who this contract is with at the beginning. So everybody receives a copy or original. And uh, only in case there's disagreements, only in case one of the parties feels cheated, so that the other party didn't do what the contract says. And then the contract gets taken with the evidence, mm. which in blockchain is essentially the state, the smart contract state is the evidence, and the smart contract is the paper contract in the, in the legal court system. And then the, the uh, public or a court, a public court, essentially um, escalates this um, issue and resolves it. So mm. it's very similar. Uh, concepts. Um, obviously, if you write a paper contract, you also don't want to share a copy with everybody around this world. With Ethereum, this is the case by default, so it okay. cannot scale as it's been built. Um, the Ethereum community works on Ethereum 2.0. We believe we already build it and hmm. it's live with Eternity. And Eternity has also other innovations inside, for example, a naming system. Um, to give human meaningful names like oh. my name yani dot chain can be registered connected to a public key mm. and this way uh, this usability simply increases um, because you can then address yeah. entities and people with their name yeah absolutely yeah. so uh, we also know that yani uh, and his uh, company eternity blockchain is based out of lishan's team mm -hmm. And we also know that Switzerland and Liechtenstein, that particular area, mm -hmm. we have seen that in the past one year, there has been a quite a spike in the number of blockchains mm -hmm. getting uh, based out of these uh, in Liechtenstein or Switzerland. Mm -hmm. And Liechtenstein, uh, to be uh, a very interesting fact came across that it has a population of 38,000. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think uh, the entire population can be, uh, uh, can be fitted into a Yankee stadium. So, mm -hmm. I mean, and one another fact that it is, it is one of the most developed country in the world. Mm -hmm. I mean, the per capita income is uh, the latest report says is US dollar 1,39,000. Mm -hmm. 
so such a forward looking country such a developed country and still they are very uh, friendly for the for mm-hmm. the overall crypto regulations mm-hmm. so what is that uh, the, what are those benefits what this lichtenstein and switzerland what your neighboring countries looking at mm-hmm. what other countries are not able to see the potential mm-hmm. yeah so generally switzerland and lichtenstein are basic democratic mm-hmm. countries um so uh, people like to be free or essentially uh it's a uh, it's a uh, there's a conception that people can vote and uh, make decisions over their government let's say stop things or uh allow things this did not happen in case of crypto um um but it's definitely empowering people and crypto is empowering people at the same time so i think it fits ideologically very well philosophically additionally to this uh, liechtenstein for example doesn't have its own currency um which um makes it like a very entrepreneurial country so they need to work with other people's money from the beginning um they are very used to this in liechtenstein you can pay at all the shops uh, with mm-hmm. francs and euros there's uh shops also who accept uh, other cryptocurrencies and uh, there's also in both countries Switzerland and Liechtenstein there's a very well established financial industry mm-hmm. which got uh quite uh impacted by uh the US and the EU trying to control everything trying to control all their citizens uh yeah. trying to make them fully transparent and um um yeah i think um here it's uh, <laughs> clear for their governments that uh, crypto is a big opportunity it is uh, mm. very fundamental for the digitalization which is mm. still happening um paper is still um kind of uh, the medium uh, right now although everybody uses more and more digital technology day to day and um yeah um when we arrived to Liechtenstein i mean originally i mean when i started the charity i was looking for a jurisdiction i uh, also was in contact with some lawyers in uh Switzerland um but the benefit of Liechtenstein here uh, with a charity or from my perspective was definitely also <coughs> being able to walk up to the decision makers for example the tax authority or the financial market regulator or representatives of the government like walk literally into the government with an appointment of course but then have a face to face meeting and discuss uh what is going to happen and essentially get uh more or less a consensus that uh, this is uh probably a unstoppable technology and mm-hmm. if we don't uh essentially use it or start using it now and jump on mm-hmm. this uh kind of like revolutionary train or in some cases also evolutionary train then we're going to miss out a big opportunity and i think uh, this got um yeah i mean um we were the first uh, crypto company uh known crypto company incorporating in Liechtenstein uh, we did this with uh, cryptocurrency as the base capital so not even a bank account was uh, re- required to okay. open or operate the company okay and um that's that's phenomenal yeah so it, th- that shows that uh, so uh, Liechtenstein is is, op- is also friendly for open blockchain so many in many countries we have seen that they talk about blockchain but yeah. but they're not in f- favor of crypto and you know uh, open blockchain but they are okay with the permission blockchain but i think mm-hmm. in lichtenstein they are also open for uh, you know they have they have uh, not differentiated between open and permission they are mm-hmm. they are okay for crypto they are open for open blockchain they are open open for permission blockchain so somewhere that's that's a unique aspect isn't it mm-hmm. absolutely um i mean i'm not sure how unique this is if there are other countries mm-hmm. who do this i mean for example i know that uh, the french market regulator in germany also allowed a regulated ERC20 token mm. representing some real estate bonds um mm. so this is definitely happening not just in Liechtenstein mm. but Liechtenstein was definitely on the forefront also with the blockchain act uh, which will become active in January the 1st mm. uh, which will allow that essentially every rights mm. like ownership rights uh for a car or a house or an asset can be represented as a token in a legally binding way also on public Absolutely. blockchains 
And um, of course, Liechtenstein is very small. Uh, you mentioned 38,000 inhabitants. Every day, yeah. 20,000 uh, come additionally from <laughs> Austria, Germany, okay. and uh, Switzerland to work there. Yeah. So there is a really strong industry. The financial industry is not even the strongest industry. So Hilti, for example, yeah. is a yeah. Liechtenstein company, but still a global player. And yeah. uh, the mindset of Liechtenstein people is that they need to be dealing with other countries other country. or global minded because they're just way too small. If you look at, for example, China, there's, I mean, Chinese people just speak Chinese and look yeah. inside China. Most of them, of course, they're exceptions. Yeah. Um, Americans uh, house is quite similar. So kind of like the bigger the country, the longer it takes to get the change done. And um, the more they're just staying inside the country. But if you have a small country, it requires you to be more innovative yeah, and more and also global minded. So uh, since you've been uh, your team, your, your ambassador here in, in India, uh, so India seems to be on a priority uh, mm -hmm. of eternity. So what message you would like to give to the Indian government and Indian regulators that why an open blockchain system is actually good for a country like India and it will actually solve the problems of mm -hmm. various problems uh, available, you know, right now in the economy. So. Mm -hmm. So how open blockchain can actually solve those problems? Well, generally, uh, let's go one step deeper. It's cryptography, it's math, it's logic. Mm -hmm. And for designing an efficient system, it's probably a very good idea to uh, make a sound foundation, mm -hmm. which is based on math, logic and cryptography. And then, of course, the blockchain as the next step to have a time stamped service. And if it's a private blockchain, this means it's in control of someone or some people. This is kind of like the mm. definition and a public or decentralized blockchain. Um, no one is in full control. So no one can change the history. And it's super important to have evidence of, for example, contracts or other documents or decisions like votes that they are uh, verifiable by the public in a temper-proof uh, way. Um, which is recognized by scientists, mathematicians, researchers, uh, which is really solid. Uh, paper can be easily faked. Um, paper money can be faked. Uh, paper contracts can be faked. But if something is timestamped mm -hmm. on a public blockchain and if like certain time passes and if, if there's proof of work, like with Bitcoin etern or Eternity mm -hmm. uh, or Ethereum at the moment, although Ethereum wants to switch, then it's kind of, it's, it's, almost impossible to change it. And you can do the math, how much you would need to spend in order to do an attack. Mm -hmm. But uh, I would also say that uh, even if, I mean, private blockchains make sense, uh, absolutely. For certain mm -hmm. use cases, private mm -hmm. blockchains mm -hmm. make sense. But uh, private blockchains will then also need to exchange value with other entities outside their private yes, uh, yes. Uh, group or other private blockchains. Yeah. And how will they do this? Probably over a public blockchain in a very similar way how uh, the, the internet and the intranet. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. there are many company intranets. Um, they have their... Um, they use um, people um, work with them, but at some point these companies, they also need to exchange documents with yeah, other yeah. intranets and they do Absolutely. this over the internet, the public internet. And it's really important mm -hmm. that it's built on open standards okay. and that it's not fully controlled, that everybody can participate. If, for example, uh, you would need to fill out forms and documents and apply and mm. wait, uh, things like Facebook and Google mm. probably would have not would happened. Have been, uh, it's just a too big barrier to entry. And we need more innovation. The digitalization has mm. essentially just started. And um, when, when essentially the internet got created, there was no cryptography. Yeah. So, uh, Yanni, this is your first time in India? Absolutely, yeah. So, you, uh, so it's your first time in you're in a blockchain conference in, in Bangalore. So what's your feeling since you've been interacting with a lot of millennials and a lot of young mm. people and technocrats and developers? What is your feeling out there? I think uh, blockchain and India fits really well together because uh, there's a democratic understanding, uh, like a democracy mm. is deep grounded here in the population. Mm. Uh, but the paper system, which is now there, um, is not really well working. I think it's no secret uh, that uh, also the, there's a high level of corruption. And with 
Uh, blockchain technology, this can be uh, made in a way that uh, it just works way more efficiently and uh, everybody essentially profits uh, from this if there is generally more trust, if things work nicely, the economy will grow faster. Uh, it's very important that uh, yeah, um, things don't corrupt or uh, things work as expected uh, mm -hmm. for a system. Of course, the system needs to be designed in a way that it can work uh, from the beginning. Um, but if it's based on, let's say, a technology which uh, simply is way too easy to tamper with or to essentially uh, fake facts or uh, uh, create an alternative uh, history, then um, this obviously mm -hmm. leads to problems. I mean, uh, uh, everybody, I think, will understand this. So yeah, yeah. I think also the young population in this young, country yeah, yeah. is a huge, huge. potential. It's a technology-hungry population. Yeah. Also, uh, the globalization here is an uh, opportunity, a big opportunity big for the people. And uh, blockchain technology is, from my, from my understanding, it's, it's, uh, it's, the, or it's a driving factor for the next era of globalization, together gotcha. also with satellite networks and mm -hmm. ubiquitous internet access all around the world. So with this word, Godfather of Ethereum is saying that tech-hungry people, young people of India, actually it's, it's the open blockchain, the entire e blockchain ecosystem is very beneficial for India and for the people of India. Thank you very much, uh, Yanni. And, uh, for more details on Eternity, we'll drop in the uh, the name of the website and we'll also, uh, if you have a Telegram channel, we'll mention that as well. Uh, so you can join the community and you can understand Eternity better. Thank you very much, Yanni. Thank Thanks you. for coming on our show. All the very best. Thank you. Thank